Hello, everyone, and welcome to Doing Trans Research in Impossible Times. A special welcome to our speaker, Tay Meadow, and our moderator, Denise Davis. I'm Sarah Gamble, I use she and her, and I run the Pembroke Public Health Collaborative here at the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. The goal of the collaborative is to bring together the fields of gender and sexuality studies and public health. And this fall, we have a focus on trans youth. Trans Youth Now is a series of online events featuring prominent scholars in trans studies and trans health, speaking about existence and resistance in the anti-trans zeitgeist. I'm thrilled to welcome Tay Meadow for the second talk in this series. I'm also looking forward to the remaining two talks in November with Paisley Curra and Michelle Forcier, for which you can register online now. A housekeeping note, we encourage you to submit questions for Professor Meadow using the Q&A function. We will address as many as we can in the time allotted. I'm going to briefly introduce our moderator who will then introduce Tay. Denise Davis is a senior lecturer in gender and sexuality studies here at Brown, where she has played a crucial role in developing the undergraduate curriculum anchored by the introductory course. She directs the graduate certificate program in gender and sexuality studies and is an editor at Differences a Journal of Feminist Cultural Studies. Uh, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Tay, and take it away. Uh, welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce Tay Meadow, uh, today's speaker in our Trans Youth Now series. Dr. Meadow is an Associate Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, who has published work focusing on a broad range of issues, including the emergence of the transgender child as a social category, the international politics of family diversity, the creation and maintenance of legal gender classifications, and newer work on the ways individuals negotiate risk in intimate relationships. Among the many essays Professor Meadow has published, she is also the author of the book, Trans Kids, Being Gendered in the 21st Century, which appeared in 2018 with the University of California Press chapters of which we often read with students to open our intro to gender and sexuality course here at Brown. By way of commenting on this book, I would like to offer a brief anecdote. A student in that intro to GNSS course approached me one day after class with some frustration and said, this book doesn't represent the vast majority of experiences that trans kids and adolescents face when they come out to their families or seek support from medical or psychiatric or, um, psychiatric clinicians, it's idealizing. My answer, I think that's part of the point. We read about hostility, rejection, and tragedy every day. Here we have immersive ethnographic evidence of the ways that support and affirmation can enable trans kids to explore their desires and become strong selves. To many, positively parenting, advocating for and clinically supporting gender atypical children is unimaginable, even unthinkable. It turns out maybe it's not that hard. Well, four years later, in a climate of extreme hostility, it turns out that being a supportive caregiver is that hard, but not necessarily for the reasons we imagined. Thank you, Tay, for coming today to talk about doing trans research in impossible times. Thank you, Denise, for that lovely introduction. I mean, I think your response was exactly right. Um, we have so much evidence for what transphobia looks like, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, and so little uh, concrete information about how support, affirmation, facilitation is available to everyone. Um, so I thank you for that. And I thank Sarah for the invitation and Rachel for the support, uh, the technical support. Um, and the Pembroke Center for inviting me. I'm looking forward to talking with you. So Donna reached out to me through Twitter last fall after a friend had read some of my work, asked if we could talk. I learned that though he was assigned female at birth, strangers had assumed her child Jack was a boy since he was a toddler. This is a typical trans story. He'd preferred boys' clothing and ways of being, interests and hobbies his whole life. By the time he was in third grade, he was identifying openly as transgender, first to peers and then to Donna and the rest of the family. 
Jack struggled with depression at times and it intensified when puberty hit. And after months of research and a year of supportive psychotherapy, Donna took Jack to an endocrinologist in 2021 when he was 14 years old, and he began a regimen of puberty blockers and cross-hormone therapy. His, de his depression abated, he was happy and thriving. This is also a typical trans story. Right around that time though, the generally conservative political climate in Texas was contracting in a new way. That same spring, the Texas state legislature had introduced 16 bills seeking to bar trans youth from competitive sports, from bathrooms, from gender segregated school environments, and to prohibit gender affirming health care. As public discussion ensued, Jack began to experience harassment at his formerly warm and supportive school, from peers and eventually even from staff. The family found threatening notes on their car. The local children's hospital halted their gender confirming care provision. Donna was spit on by an angry crowd while leaving a legislative session in which she'd testified against the sports bill. Then the governor, Greg Abbott, threatened removal from trans, of trans children from supportive parents, and she panicked. What if Jack fell off his longboard and broke his arm? Could she safely bring him to an emergency room? When I met Donna on Zoom last November, she and Jack had been living in a Colorado neighborhood for almost four months. Jack was 16, nearing the end of his first semester at a new school, and they were both trying to adjust to life hundreds of miles from Jack's father, stepfather, and brother. Jack liked his new school. He appeared for a moment in the Zoom frame while Donna and I were talking. He smiled at me and ran his hair through his disheveled textured crop cut. He was on his way to the zoo with friends. Texas has introduced 58 anti-trans measures and passed laws banning trans athletes from intercollegiate sports, prohibiting insurers from allowing the gender provision, uh, the provision of gender affirming care to minors. Jack has finished his first year, school year in Colorado and the family is still separated as his stepfather continues to job hunt from Texas. On January 23rd of last year, or actually of this year, pardon me, Colorado introduced its own anti-trans sports bill, the Women's Rights and Athletics Act, and the cycle of worry for Donna began anew. While that measure was ultimately defeated, it took a literal army of scholars, clinicians, and activists to beat it. And these struggles are ongoing in states across the United States. Now, two weeks after Donna and I spoke, I received another email from a well-known feminist public intellectual with whom I have some professional overlap. Someone who's writing on abortion, racism, welfare reform, and prison politics has been read by millions of people around the globe. She asked if we could speak by phone because the trans, uh, about, quote, the trans issue, because she's regularly asked what she thinks and, quote, the whole thing makes me very uncomfortable. A few days later, I found myself two hours into a call that ranged from medical particulars about the operation of hormone blockers to abstract comparisons between trans surgery and female genital mutilation. I broke one of my cardinal rules of academic engagement to leave myself and my body out of the conversation. I tell my coming out story. I discuss my medical decision-making. I talk about being a trans feminist. And by the time I hang up the phone, I was as depleted as I have ever been after one of these conversations. And I put aside the writing tasks I'd hoped to accomplish that day and went out for a walk. Now, over the last 18 months, I've spoken with nearly a dozen families like Jack's families displaced by the virulent anti-trans political climate, families moving across state lines or traveling hundreds of miles for medical and psychiatric care, families forced into hiding to protect their child's physical safety. I've visited four schools, some after incidences of bullying or violence. I've fielded questions from academics, psychologists, from organizational consultants, from podcasters, from filmmakers, and from journalists. I've submitted testimony in a custody hearing. I've met with three parent groups. I've been asked to ghostwrite six professional letters and formal policies. I've, asked to sign, I've been asked to sign two non-disclosure agreements. These are the requests that I accepted. There were others. Sometimes I was responding to an interpersonal disagreement, sometimes to an institutional standpoint. In a small handful of conversations, I was addressing one person's individual sense of, quote, discomfort. Almost none of this work was paid. In the meantime, I've stalled progress on my own professional work, turned down requests for talks and other academic travel and taken time away from my own child. This is a terrifying time to be LGBTQ in America. As of today, the ACLU is tracking 520 ac active anti-LGBT legislative measures across the 50 states, restricting free speech, access to healthcare, access to equitable public accommodations in schools, athletics, and libraries. 
Among those threatened are LGBTQ people ourselves, parents and family members, teachers, coaches, physicians, and psychologists. Over 250 of the most virulent of these laws specifically target transgender minors and the adults who care for them. These are the people engaged directly in either living LGBTQ lives or supporting those who do. What we don't often acknowledge, even among ourselves, is the toll these measures take on us in the business, on those of us that are in the business of intellectual support. So I published my book, Trans Kids, in 2018, and in it, I argued that the first generation of families openly and publicly ex facilitating explicit transgender identities in youth was transforming cultural understandings of gender and sexuality. To make this claim, I did several years of intensive ethnographic immersion in parent support groups, organizations, and interviews with over 100 parents, activists, advocates, and clinicians. I spent time with trans youth themselves at conferences, support groups, and in their homes, though I didn't interview them formally. And at that time, one could make the claim that parents who in decades prior might have affirmed a child's gender, nonconformity, and isolation now did so in community, that an evolving lexicon of gendered words allowed individual children and their parents to typologize gender in new and ever more intricate ways. This was an optimistic tale, both for culture and for youth themselves. Because we know that the social climate around transgender youth affects nearly every metric of psychological and educational success we measure, these new words and practices and communities were cause for celebration. But that moment was short-lived, and now we're living in a paradoxical clash of two cultural realities. On the one hand, some say that rates of public transgender identification are on the rise, possibly more than doubling in the last five years alone. And at the same time, there's a eugenic political movement in place and they control popular discourse and political debate. As I've reflected on these last months, it seems to me that there are three mechanisms through which trans-exclusionary politics operates. The first is by sedimenting cisgender assumptions into depersonalized institutional practices. The second is by privileging anti-trans rhetorical frameworks. And the third is by requiring what I've come to think of as a hamster wheel of response. I'm gonna address each of these very briefly today and you can ask more questions in the Q&A. So on the level of law, there's a coordinated multi-state attack on transgender America about which there's open and very public acknowledgement. Legislation currently up for consideration seems to target almost everything it means to be a person in the world. Some measures seek to enshrine draconian biological definitions of male and female in a variety of contexts and to prohibit legal name and gender changes on official documents. Some allow for religiously motivated discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations. Some ban mention of trans people, lives, and identities in schools and public libraries. Some proposed laws mandate the disclosure to unsupportive or even abusive parents of admissions of trans identities by youth in schools. Some threaten felony prosecution for medical doctors and therapists who provide affirmative care. Teachers, doctors, psychologists risk losing their livelihoods and their licenses. Parents risk losing their children for allowing them to live openly as trans. In spite of news coverage seeking to frame this as a site of debate, there is a near consensus among actual experts on these youth on the negative impact of these politicized efforts, not to mention the public rituals of humiliation they require for families seeking to counter them. Conservative politicians know that political orientation serves as a proxy for perspective on trans acceptance, making youth an expedient vehicle for showcasing one's conservatism. This is most evident when you consider that the proposed bills and government mandates contravene the public advice of every major medical and psychiatric organization in the United States. Now, I assume if you're here that nearly all of you know about some of these laws from local and national media coverage or opinion pieces about medical transition for teenagers or what to do with athletes in elite competitive gendered sports. But as Ezra Klein wrote for the New York Times, even the most liberal Americans are unaware of the sheer scale and cruelty of the current legal landscape. I know Paisley Karaz coming to discuss these laws with you in detail and to enumerate um, the ways in which they contravene the core principles of co the constitution like freedom of speech, um, central facets of human dignity like bodily autonomy, and previously formidable hierarchies of knowledge that took the word of physicians and psychologists, the more majority of who support social transitions for youth as a social fact. But what's harder to see from the outside is the downward creep of these legal measures into the micro-institutional context that kids inhabit. From schools to intramural sports leagues to hospitals, organizations now feel as if they must make trans policy 
sometimes for protective reasons and sometimes for prophylactic reasons. I'm often asked to opine in the abstract about what an institutional orientation to an imagined problem might be. I can gather best practices and supply them, but they are then debated in a depersonalized environment in which an anxious fantasy can run rampant. Depersonalization has the effect of positioning trans people as abstract prod problems rather than flesh and blood human beings, often asking for quite small and simple accommodations. The second mechanism involves the privileging of anti-trans and trans-skeptical rhetorical frames. This comes in a range of forms, including the explicitly eugenic. For example, at CPAC this year, Tom Fitton, president of Judicial Watch, opined that providing trans-affirmative care was, quote, a demonic assault on the innocence of our children. The conservative commentator Michael Knowles made the aims of this coordinated attack clear when he said, quote, there can be no middle way in dealing with transgenderism. It's all or nothing. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. Now, it's easy to spot eugenic logics when they're made explicit, but harder to identify when they're embedded in journalistic contexts or social scientific research. Over the last few years, there's been a marked shift in the kinds of topics that newspapers cover. Whereas prior to 2016, most media coverage of trans children and their families performed a fascination with trans identities themselves, with the multiplicity of gender identities, and the process through which adults came to understand particular children as transgender, made bids for the recognition of those children as boys or girls in the world, but now we see something quite different. Major so-called liberal media like The Atlantic and The New York Times have been roundly criticized for employing trans-skeptical framing in their reporting. The Times ran a cover story on what they termed, quote, the battle over gender therapy, offering, patter, offering parody to the dominant trans affirmative stance of the vast majority of the medical establishment in this country, and alongside a handful of dissenting and alarmist clinical voices. The Atlantic has run a series of articles that purported to explore the phenomenon of trans youth, but which foregrounded and focused on what they termed desisters, youth who decide against transition but who might be better termed detransitioners. Detransitioners represent a tiny fraction of trans experience, but it is nearly impossible to write about trans people without including them and without making them, without, without always seeing trans life in reference to them and to the possibility that it could be cisgender life instead. This skepticism is extending into the construction of social science research and psychological practice. A notable example is um, psychologist Lisa Littman, who, who coined the term rapid onset gender dysphoria in 2018 to rename the well-established phenomenon of coming into a trans identity during puberty. Now, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? The timing of it. What greater confrontation with the realities of biology is there than the onset of pubertal development? But anxieties about social contagion underwrite attempts to determine how quickly one can know they are trans. Littman argued for a category of experience that might be considered, quote, too fast. On its face, the article appeared to describe a group of children who could potentially be cherry picking trans identities from the TikTok scape. On closer examination, however, it turned, that, it turned out that she failed to acknowledge that her study was based solely on the perceptions of parents and did not take the self-reported experiences of the youth into account. Parents thought the onset of a trans identity in their child was rapid. Whether that was factually correct or matched the self-understanding of their child was outside the scope of the inquiry. Neither, nonetheless, the term and its acronym ROGD then traveled into the media and into the psychological literature. The significant subsequent um, correction and reformulation Littman offered in the journal often goes unnoticed. Now I've written at length about this rhetoric elsewhere, and there are similar logics in all of these types of reporting a belief in the superiority of a cisgender experience, a tacit commitment to skepticism about claims of transgender identity in children, and a phobic reaction to the possibility of medical treatment in general. This is incredibly damaging, not merely because it is flawed reporting and bad social science, but because it becomes pedagogical, seeping into the frameworks of common readers unfamiliar with trans people's lives. It teaches us how to think about trans in the abstract and how to approach trans people in the particular. Finally, in the wake of these legal, administra administrative, institutional, and rhetorical controversies, we see the medical and psychiatric governing boards like the AMA, APA, major human rights organizations, policymakers, researchers like myself, 
and parent activists scrambling to speak back in what has become an impossible rhetorical landscape. The single most powerful move conservative lawmakers have made is to place transgender Americans and our advocates on an endless hamster wheel of response to a seemingly never ending barrage of small attacks on the fact that trans people exist and that they require recognition from others. I can't tell you how many times over the past several years I have regurgitated these facts that no, there is no evidence that suggests that affirmation and support endangers the well being of trans and gender non conforming youth. In fact, a litany of social science suggests precisely the opposite. Trans youth who receive support from their families, peers, and communities look a lot like cisgender children. They have similar levels of self-esteem, are no more likely to be depressed than their peers. Even their gender development mirrors that of cisgender youth who share their gender identities. Perhaps the most surprising takeaway from this research is that their lives can be pretty unsurprising when they feel safe in their families and communities. It is lack of social support, lack of gender, access to gender appropriate facilities and medical care, fear for emotional, material, and bodily safety that make trans youth suffer. And that's precisely what's happening right now. And I continue to use my platform as a social scientist to mobilize my Ivy League credentials to continue to parrot these facts again and again. But, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot this past year, these laws and practices and discourses are designed to do more than exclude trans people from social spaces or to make transition more difficult for youth to pursue. They're designed to make it rhetorically impossible to simply assume that trans people, particularly trans and gender non-conforming youth, have a basic right to exist, to be loved, and to participate openly in their communities. They are designed to exhaust professionals, parents, researchers, advocates, and allies. They're designed to keep the uneducated public wondering if they need to bother to stretch, learn, or grow. They're designed to keep everyone frightened and complicit in a conservative cultural fantasy that if we just punish trans people hard enough, or if we just doubt the validity of identities long enough, trans people will go away. Part of how homo and cis sexism function is to set the contours of public debate. LGBTQ Americans, our families, and our service providers must, must constantly struggle to legitimate our realities in the eyes of others, most consequentially in the eyes of those to seek, who seek to prohibit, prescribe, and punish LGBTQ ways of living. This requires us to sit in an always responsive position to a discourse that seeks explicitly to harm us. Black feminists like Toni Morrison wrote in the 1970s about racism as a tactic of exhaustion. Queer theorists like Michael Warner wrote in the 1990s about heteronormativity's mandate to produce endless, disorganized, and reactive social science. And now in this trans moment, we're called upon to prove again and again that transness is not a proxy for psychopathy, that transition is good for trans youth and bad for nobody else that it is climates of fear and intolerance that cause social harm, not YouTube videos about how to give yourself a wolf cut at home. If you don't know what a wolf cut is, I suggest you ask your non-binary students. Now, as a, sociology, as a sociologist who studies gender and sexual diversity in a very broad sense, I have repeatedly stalled newer projects to assist families in conflict with schools, communities, and care providers. I've been called in to do crisis management in schools and corporations. I've been approached to publish opinion pieces arguing for the same positions publicly held by major medical and psychiatric organizations, that the identities of trans and gender nonconforming youth are valid, unlikely to change, and that they are just like the sets of feelings and, and desires and self-understandings young children can absolutely know they have, that affirmative medical and psychiatric care is the only appropriate and responsible option, and that literal decades of literature demonstrate both the social success of trans youth, transitioned trans youth, and the absolute catastrophic emotional, educational, and social toll of non-acceptance. This is settled science that can be unsettled anew by anyone seeking to bolster a conservative political persona. This conversation is infinitely renewable. This is not merely a waste of emotional and material resources. It forestalls continued work on the nuances of affirmative care, I know clinicians who are too worried about self-protection to provide care, to follow up with previous patients, and to research new and better positive interventions. 
Researchers like me cannot move on to new projects, can't count on continuing to find open and willing pools of participants in conservative environments. Indeed, many of us are inundated with fake respondents seeking to derail our projects or hostile and threatening emails directed at our students and research assistants. Most importantly, our own lives, once outward looking and creatively different, driven, become subsumed by a constant race to rescue individuals from micro microclimates of abuse. This work demands not merely time, but also a kind of respectability politics. As I work on my next ethnographic book, which is on complex sexual practices and communities, I worry about my continued viability as an advocate for youth, and I worry it's gonna make me less helpful. Beyond that, and this is something many of us discuss privately, this moment is emotionally exhausting. The discourse of scientific debate exacts a heavy emotional toll on those of us who do this work and identify as LGBTQ. I can speak from firsthand experience and tell you that these dynamics enact a kind of psychic violence on all of us called forth to defend our identities, communities, and ways of life, to withstand accusations of impartiality and undesirability, to argue dispassionately for our rights to exist and for the rights of those who we study and serve, to comfort our terrified students, colleagues and research participants, and to explain this world and its cruelty to our own children. But for now, it's more essential that we have these conversations than that we don't. To raise open and studied dissent when laws are unjust or violent, to train cisgender colleagues and students on how to engage in trans affirmative worldviews and how to become effective advocates themselves, and to how to share some of this burden with us for that reason, I invite everyone in this audience to ask me whatever questions you have that will allow you to take the baton and become part of the next wave of first responders. Thanks. Um, you're that that's the end there we go that's all i got uh thanks so much for um such unfortunately a, a rather depressing picture um of what's going on right now um so i, I i've been thinking about you know something that you wrote about in your book was this whole question of the trans tipping point right that in 2018 we could still talk about the trans tipping point there was a lot of media coverage and representation in fact there was even a question of you know the sort of um we'd gone from trans identity to trans in an industry of 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 representing um trans people and now of course we're in the midst of a backlash which is taking the form of a moral panic i would i would i'd i'd you can tell me what you think about that characterization. Um, so we're stuck in this paradox of visibility, of lying low and avoiding rhetorical violence or demanding recognition, recognition and being subjected to hostility. And I guess I just wonder what, where do you think we go from here? What, what's, where, where is this going? I mean, that's such a hard question, right? I think it depends on everybody in this room in a way right? We are all actors in this particular political moment. And to the extent that we can mobilize an effective response, you know, we have hope moving forward. I do think that, you know, to some extent, visibility brings an increased opportunity for, uh, for backlash. Um, and it also brings an increased opportunity for resistance. And that's why I keep walking into schools. And that's why I keep walking into companies because I do believe that we're going to have to change culture a little bit at a time. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, 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 that academics like to talk about the trans tipping point, whether in fact it exists, whether, you know, the trans, the category of the transgender child is new or whether it's just different language for something that's been there before. I think the answer is both. I think those of us that study social categories know that they exist in a recursive relationship to social reality. Um, and so I think that it's really a question of continuing to have these conversations but but like you like you said in the beginning, Denise, giving people the material that they need to engage the world from a position um, of trans affirmation and from a position of 
seeing trans as just one of the many ways that people can be as a kind of benign variation, as a terrific outcome, so long as someone is in an environment in which they're not being you know, openly harassed, right? And, and, and to create a generation of parents that can look at the kids they are about to have from the perspective that it would be just as good if they ended up being trans as if they ended up being cis. And once we get there, then we no longer have a problem. And I think that world is possible. Uh, thanks. I, 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 I absolutely agree with you. I don't, um, I don't know what the timeline is on this. I mean, it's obviously, it, it's just striking how the violence is, um, it seems inexhaustible. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I just wanted to ask you if you might tell us a positive story about where the, the, the work that you're doing right now that is taking away from your more academic work, the, the, all the activism. Um, have you been in situations where you actually feel that people, you might open their minds or, or yeah. can we change hearts and minds? I think you can. Uh, I have been in a number of schools where, uh, you know, they're they're kind of dealing with their first trans student, um, you know, and there are people who make it their business to go into environments and do these kinds of trainings, and that's how they make money. And I often will send schools to those organizations. Um, I tend to do it when the schools don't have the resources because I get my paycheck elsewhere. And those are often schools that, you know, you know, don't have routine tra trainings on gender and sexuality for staff or for administrators or for youth. And, um, and I think it's very possible to change hearts and minds. I think it's very possible to give people alternate frameworks for understanding the world. And, you know, most often with children who, who are still receiving the world as it's presented to them um, in a very daily way. And I think that um, I've seen tremendous openness among youth to the idea that there are lots of different ways to be a gendered person. There are lots of different ways to be a boy, lots of different ways to be a girl, and lots of different ways to kind of figure out a space outside of those two categories for yourselves. Um, I think that teachers and administrators often have different sets of concerns. They're about managing collective life. And I think that one of the primary misconceptions people have is that it's going to be a big deal to support trans students. And it's certainly going to be a big deal dealing with those people who think that that is an inappropriate thing to do. And administrators in particular are often um, navigating the complex landscape of uh, kind of working with people who really see this as not only not a big deal, but the absolute right thing to do and people who actively resist it, whether it's parents or teachers. Um, but I do think that uh, showing people how, how easy it is to do, how minimally disruptive it is to give trans students the facilities they need to configure athletic um, participation in such a way that nobody is excluded, to kind of talk in very simple terms about trans being something uh, that, is, that is pretty common in the world and, 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 and a way that people can be, that that kind of work can be done pretty readily if there is a willingness to absorb the information. I think that what we're seeing in terms of the political climate is particularly terrifying in the context of banning certain kinds of speech because it makes that work impossible. And that is where I think that, you know, the, the institution level stuff has to be scaffolded by a com di completely different um, legal architecture. Like it cannot be unspeakable. We can't go back to a place where um, it is impossible to imagine LGBTQ way ways of living. Um, so that's where that's where I get sort of my most pessimistic. But on the level of, in, of, of, of human beings, person to person, there's just tremendous room for change. Um, I, we do have the, the Q&A is now filling up as, as anticipated. Um, so we have uh, uh, a question. Uh, I wondered if you have any thoughts on or experience with the way these anti-trans movements simultaneously mobilize the idea of children as helpless, unknowing, and endangered, for example, Abigail Schreier's irreversible damage or the gays against groomers groups in Britain, 
and children as duplicitous, manipulative, and even dangerous actors who know too much, as in Littman's um, um, ROGD piece the, uh, or, the, or the charge that children are using the threat of suicide to force their parents to affirm them. It would seem that they couldn't quite have it both ways, and yet, is it just that the fact of successfully being trans removes a trans child from the category of child? I mean, isn't that fascinating how phobic logics don't need to make any sense at all, right? Like on the one hand, you can have this idea that, that kids can't possibly know this about themselves. And yet they can also be manipulators that are creating a social contagion among their peers. And I, I kind of think that that we can sit here in this kind of a, you know, in, in the Pembroke Center, where I believe that this kind of dialogue is, is openly welcomed, and we can see the inconsistency of that. But the thing about logics of fear is that they shut down the rational mind, right? So you can be afraid that, that kids are bad actors and also be afraid um, that your own child doesn't have the capacity to know things about themselves. But I often will, you know, say to, um, particularly this works really well with parents, you know, who are struggling with these issues. Like, you know, did you know that you were a boy or a girl when you were a kid? How did you know? Did anyone ever challenge you on that? And if they had, what would you have said, right? And everybody can look back on, on their own, on, on the things that they really knew about themselves when they were children. And, and it makes it harder to imagine that other children don't know things about themselves. Now, childhood and, and, and psychological development, you know, it, it's processual, right? And, and, and it, it, you know, and I think that this, this sense of like, well, maybe, maybe kids don't know they're trans or maybe, you know, they could be convinced of it when in fact they could go another way um, also seeks to sort of flatten out that gender development isn't linear, that it's full of ambivalence, right? Like, you know, my mom tells the story about not being allowed to wear pants to school in high school and how frustrating that was for her. Now, my mother is not a particularly masculine person, but she is a person who much prefers to wear pants. And she wasn't ambivalent about being female, but she was ambivalent about the rules that attended femaleness, right? And yet we expect tra trans kids, particularly those that have a, a, um, a cross-gender identity, to have no ambivalence about that identity at all. To, if you want to, if, if you, you know, if you identify as female, you must be completely unambivalent about femininity, whereas we don't expect that of cisgender women. Cisgender women are filled with gender ambivalence. And so I think that there's also this way in which it's not only that we expect trans kids to know things about themselves, but we expect them to know them with more certainty than we would expect of anybody else. And in that way, and that is actually where the fundamental paradox is. It's not about whether they're passive or active in the same way you know you could you could apply to anything related to childhood it's that the burden of proof for trans youth is excruciatingly high nearly impossible to meet and so in a way i think that is actually the most damaging thing and that's the thing that bleeds even into people and communities that seek to affirm trans youth is this idea that somehow they're going to do gender better than everybody else and be less ambivalent about it and, 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 you know, in some ways, years beyond where they are developmentally. Um, okay, uh, the questions are all just, they're so great, and they're so difficult. So I'm just, I'll just keep pitching them to you. Um, how do you understand the conservative uh, parents' rights push? in the education space in relation to trans students' rights? Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's really fascinating that this has become a parents' rights issue um, uh, in a way that, that you know, I, I think that, that queer writers have written uh, a lot and for many, many decades about the logic of the child and how child protectionism often will underwrite any number of different conservative political arguments, right? That if we don't get this right, if we don't, you know, restrict the evolution of culture in some profound way, that the children are going to be harmed. And part of the logic in, of that argument is that parents should get to decide what things, what cultural 
um, opportunities children are exposed to. And that that's somehow, um, because there is disagreement about how children should be, you know, enculturated, that, that it should ultimately be up to the parents to determine that. But here's the, the illogic of that is, A, if we believed fundamentally in um, the ability of the standard American parent to fully educate their child, we might not have organized schools to begin with. If we believed fundamentally in, um, in that parents are always making good decisions, teachers would not be mandated reporters, right? We wouldn't have a children's services you know, section of the administrative government. We understand that human beings are imperfect. And so the parents' rights logic, particularly around something like fundamental rights, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and it, it tends to be uh, more successful in conservative social environments that are operating to some extent on the logic of the family in that way. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine two questions because I think they're they're two sides of the same coin and having to do with representational politics and uh, legislative politics and more changing hearts and minds. Or um, so uh, from a local representative, a local um, uh, one of our members of the uh, state assembly, she asks, um, which cultural changes do you feel come first and where will they most be impactful? What role does policy or legislation play in these changes? And the other question is, there's a limit to visibility and representational politics. How do we extend the conversation beyond the discursive fixation on trans body, uh, trans bodies or trans embodiment, not forgetting the real daily needs, but extending how we, how we view trans identities and beings? How might cis non-trans questioning, both those who resist and try to affirm trans existence, um, of their gendered self be a starting point to address anti-trans violence? Mm -hmm. These are great questions. I, I do think that law and policy, particularly that which enshrines very broad protections is an important, I mean, if, if, you're, in a, if you're a state assembly person, I cannot um, understate how important that is. I think that it has different effects. One is that it, provides concrete guidance to people who wanna know what's allowed, right? And if discrimination or um, uh, exclusion from particular public spaces is not allowed, then it's not allowed, right? But the other thing is it sends a cultural signal, right? That this climate is hospitable to LGBTQ people, not just children, but adults as well, um, which is a humongous relief to families, to care providers, to know that on the level of policy, broad scale policy, there is support, affirmation, and a kind of non-intrusion into family life when that life is facilitated, right? Um, with regard to, you know, the over-medicalization of trans in public discourse, I think that this has long been the case, right? A focus not on what, trans people feel, but on what they might want to do to their bodies. And it's incredibly damaging and frankly, none of anybody's business. Um, I think that parents make medical decisions for their children all the time that contravene the advice of medical professionals. And parents make medical decisions for their children all the time that, you know, and it, parents are studied consumers of medicine in a variety of ways. Um, and I think that medical decision-making is something that should be left to doctors and psychologists to discuss with children and parents, that it isn't the business of lawmakers to do anything other than to potentially enshrine a kind of bodily autonomy, um, broad scale that is under attack in this country in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that that really kind of having a cultural discourse that suggests that, you know, my genitals are none of anyone else's business apart from my closest intimates and my medical providers is the framework for understanding this. And, you know, this is easily reinforceable with 
you know, the public opinions of every major medical and psychiatric governing board in this country who have consensus and the evolving standards of care that, that within those um, governing boards regulate the treatment of trans people, right? And that are based on lots of, you know, lots of study and practice and decades and decades of thought and care and which have been influenced largely by trans people themselves, right? So if you go um, to WPATH meetings, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, you'll see that a growing number of the clinicians that are behind these efforts to study um, and optimize and continue to evolve affirmative care are trans people themselves. So I actually think that that part of it requires um, a, a stance of less interference from government and a, and a kind of um, a rhetorical policy of, you know, that is private personal information and, and things that other people don't necessarily have to understand, right? So I don't get emails from public intellectuals because they're uncomfortable with, I don't know, for example, people's decision to go on antidepressants. And they don't ask me as somebody who has spent time on antidepressants in my lifetime, um, you know, to legitimate that and, you know, and to tell me how that's, you know, compatible with a version of feminism that, you know, understands that the world makes women depressed, right? I mean, we don't get asked to legitimate our medical decision making in other contexts, and we shouldn't be asked to legitimate it here either. Um, and, and, and for parents who are really kind of trying to find information, you know, medical professionals who affirm and support trans youth have tons of it for you. It is out there to be found. And you know, if you if you consult Dr. Google, as with any other um, medical condition, the the quality of the information that you will receive will be mixed, unless you know where to look. So, I don't know if that gets at all of it. Uh, thank you. You mentioned WPATH, and there's a question about um, the new WPATH SOCH eight, which I'm not. I don't know what the SOCH eight actually is. So maybe you can explain that the part of the question. So it says with the new WPATH SOCH 8, what are some key improvements in language that we use in research or general discussion? You know, I'm not, so, so SOCH 8 is the new standards of care um, that governs uh, the treatment of, of, of trans folks. Um, I am not an expert in the developments of the new standards of care. And because I'm trying desperately to move my research in new directions, um, I'm going to demur on that question. Uh, I, there's a, a lot of public writing uh, with reactions to those standards of care. Some people see it as a tremendous improvement, and other people have pretty studied critiques of the ways in which it continues to limit trans people's autonomy or put in structures of you know gatekeeping. Um, so I think that you know depending on 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 where you look, you'll see that you know there is a way in which. Um, physicians and psychologists are navigating their own anxieties about providing trans affirming care um, and, and, and a desire to grant as much autonomy to trans folks you know, as they can. And uh, so this is one solution to that particular tension. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, question, what ideas well, excuse me, what ideas or encouragement do you have for those who live in states where diversity training, um, sorry, I actually used, well, uh, diversity training is now illegal in schools where banning speech, books, and firing teachers is part of the institutional norm. It does feel impossible. And as you said, we need to create legal change, but that takes so much time. Um, and I would add, especially given the the way that our electoral politics are going right now. Um, so the question, sorry, this just shifted. Uh, what possibilities are there for kids now? And again, in your talk, it was really discouraging, I have to say, to hear that parents are having to split up their families in order to take uh, they're a trans child across state lines in order to go to public schools or to any schooling at all. Um, so it's just an ironic that we're protecting families by splitting up families. Um, so this question, what, poss what possibilities are there for kids now? Yeah, I mean, 
this is, it, it's so crazy that we're having this conversation in 2023. Um, and this is a new kind of um, what Michael Warner called heteronormativity, which I think is a, is a, is a word that, you know, is used often without a lot of specificity um, in what it marks. And I think what it marks is a cultural orientation that makes it impossible to think of uh, LGBTQ ways of living, right? That makes it even unimaginable how that would look. And I think that that for the, you know, really the first time historically, there is a subset of policy that is making this completely unspeakable in a way that, I mean, it, it seems so profoundly inconsistent with the constitution that it's hard to imagine how this could possibly stand. Um, I think that there is no way to raise a child in that context and shield them from the sheer violence of that landscape without capitulating to a different version of heteronormativity, right? So if you just don't talk about trans and you don't talk about LGBTQ ways of living um, because you don't wanna let children know how bad things are, and I think this can be the reaction to people whose children are trans, right? Like, I don't want my kid to know how bad it is. So, you know, we're just not gonna talk about that. I think that that it it just, it enacts a different kind of violence. And I think that one of the things that we know to be true about younger generations is that they are more open politically. They are more open to alternate ways of living. And I think that the more young people understand that they are being told that they can't talk about something, right? Um, and whether that's done person to person over a cup of coffee or anywhere else, right? Um, the more likely they are to join the resistance to that kind of suppression, right? And this suppression is happening everywhere. It's happening in major um, academic journals. It's happening everywhere. And it needs to be discussed openly so that we can help, particularly adolescents and early adults, understand that they are on their way to political power and that how they use that power, and this is cisgender kids as well, have to understand that, that this is bearing down on them as well and their freedom of speech and their freedom of expression. And so I think really beginning a conversation about what the laws are and what they prohibit. You know, I have an 11 year old and boy, there's nothing she wants more than whatever I tell her she can't have, right? And so in a way it's kind of like, my hope is that by making the contours and the violence of this, this political landscape plain to youth, we can help empower them to resist it, to be unwilling to accept it as their future. Um, I'm so heartened by, I do think that younger, the next gen, I mean, if we just look at where a lot of this um, really transphobic legislation is coming from and what generation it's coming from, it does, you know, seem that maybe there's hope. Um, I think this will probably be the last question because we're running out of time and it's um, hopefully again, hopefully we can end on something like a positive note, but I'm not trying to script what you have to say. Um, is there anything that you would say to a non-binary student hoping to do research with transgender folks and mental health who is daunted by going into this field at such a fraught time? Here's what I'll say to you. One of my most cherished academic advisors in graduate school told me that my dissertation, which was the basis for trans kids, was career suicide. That this was a small population, who cares? Um, that, you know, it was politically dangerous, that it was gonna be frustrating. And that person has apologized to me more than once for saying that. It doesn't mean I didn't go home and cry after that conversation. Any important genre changing work will meet resistance. But I'm here to tell you that it's very possible to have a rich and robust and deeply intellectual life that also makes the world better. And in fact, if that's not what we're doing, 
what is the point of any of it, right? What is the point of intellectual exchange that isn't gesturing toward a better world? And I am enough of an optimist to believe that the only reason why such a virulent backlash would be happening is because things are changing, right? If 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 things weren't um, becoming more possible, if, if ways of living weren't becoming broader, there wouldn't be resistance, right? There, there would be no reason for it. And so I think that there is tons of room for you to do any kind of research that really, you know, sparks your interest. And if it feels important to you, then it's almost certainly important to lots of other people too. So I don't actually think that this is a bad time to want to do that kind of research. I think it is an urgent time. I think that's why there are lecture series like the one that you're attending today. And that's why we are all so very busy trying to talk about this issue and work on it. And we need you, frankly. So, you know, get moving. Uh, I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a what a note to end on. Um, and so unfortunately, that is all the time we have with Professor Meadow today. I want to thank her and Denise for sharing so generously of their time, as well as everyone who attended and all the folks behind the scenes who made it happen. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Professor Meadow. Thank you so We're much. We're so grateful. Thank you.